Hello, I am Teddy Turfett, an analytics engineer here at Seek. In today's tips and tricks videos, we are going to take a look at Seek's machine learning tools, specifically the anomaly detection tools, self-organizing map, and isolation forest. You'll find both of these tools under the tool panel and the machine learning category. Before we dive into using the tools, we'll take a quick look at what each algorithm does so you have a better sense of which one to use in different scenarios. Let's start with isolation forest. Isolation forests are great for detecting outliers in multi-dimensional data sets. Some outliers can be hard to spot when you're only looking at one signal at a time. But when you analyze the data as a whole, isolation forest can help uncover those hidden anomalies quickly. The goal of an isolation forest algorithm is to identify data points that deviate significantly from normal behavior. It does this by randomly splitting the data into smaller subsets and measuring how quickly a point becomes isolated. These splits are made using a decision tree, hence the name isolation forest. The faster a point becomes isolated, the more anomalous it is. Let's walk through a visual example. Here we have two signals. At first glance, nothing seems unusual. But if we plot the signals against each other in a scatter plot, we start to see something interesting. An outlier begins to stand out. Now imagine we begin splitting the data randomly, just like an isolation forest would. First, we split the data vertically. To the left of the green line, there's 26 points. The right has 13 points. No points have been isolated yet. Next, we split it horizontally. The bottom left now has 26 points. The bottom right has five points, and the top has eight points. You can see we're starting to isolate clusters. One more split, and now we have our first isolated point. By repeating this random splitting process and measuring how many steps it takes to isolate each point, we get a clear picture of which ones are anomalous. Now let's take a look at the self-organizing map algorithm. Like isolation forests, self-organizing maps aim to detect anomalies when a data point falls outside expected patterns. But the way they do this is quite different. Self-organizing maps use a type of neural network to project high-dimensional data onto a two-dimensional grid. Once mapped, the data points are grouped based on similarity. After the grouping is complete, the centers of these groups are determined. We can review new samples by comparing their distance to the nearest group center. The further the point is from the closest group, the more anomalous it's considered. This clustering or grouping behavior also gives self-organizing maps an advantage as they are able to better account for different operating modes and gradual changes over time, such as process drift. For our self-organizing map visual example, We'll start with the clusters already formed on a two-dimensional grid. Since showing the full dimension reduction process visually can be a bit tricky. Now let's say we have a new data point shown here in red. To check if this point's anomalous, we calculate its Euclidean distance from the nearest cluster center. The further away it is, the more likely it is to be considered an anomaly. As you can imagine, we have taken some liberties to simplify how these algorithms work in the visual demos, but hopefully they have helped give you a general understanding of the core concepts behind each method. With that, let's jump back into Seek and walk through an example using real data. All right, now that we're back in Seek, let's go ahead and take a look at our first algorithm, Isolation Forest. I've pre-populated a work step for each algorithm in the journal tab to load the data, so we'll go ahead and select those. Since we're gonna use a two signal data set, let's go ahead and put it in XY plot so we can see what the data looks like in a scatter plot view. All right, now let's go ahead and select the isolation forest from the machine learning category in the tools panel. I'll go ahead and give it a name like I would for any other tool. And we'll go ahead and add the input signals. I'll leave the training window the same. Uh, and we'll go ahead and open the advanced options here. You'll see the standard advanced options, such as limit to a training condition and restrict the output to within another condition. You may see those in other tools. 
however, there is an additional training configuration here. So we'll go ahead and select that. You have the option to change the number of estimators, which will essentially change the number of splits that is going to happen in your data set. For this case, I'll go ahead and set that to 15. If you want more information on what each one of these parameters is, you can go ahead and click on the question mark and it'll link you to our knowledge base. The other thing we're going to want to change here is the contamination option. I'm going to go ahead and set this to 0 0.01. Uh, the contamination is the expected number of anomalies in your data set or contaminated samples in your data set. Uh, since this data set is fairly clean and you can see the bulk of our data is all centered here, 0 0.01 makes sense. Now, since this is the isolation forest method, we'll probably want to ignore short capsules and gaps. Um, so I'll go ahead and set the ignore capsules shorter than 30 minutes and gaps shorter than 20 minutes. With that, we'll go ahead and click execute and take a look at our result. All right, you see that I need to change the color here. So we'll go ahead and color based on condition and you can see the isolation forest. And you can see the bottom half where these uh, samples are, are what it's considering anomalous. So let's go back to TrendView and take a look at what it found in TrendView. Essentially, it found this dip uh, when the orange signal uh, dipped down more than normal. So you could definitely consider that an anomaly. One other cool thing about the isolation forest method is if we go ahead and duplicate this, you can also get the output as a signal. So this will allow us to see the output as a signal. I'll just make sure that the advanced configuration is still the same and we'll return this as a signal. And you can go ahead and see uh, how it looks. The one thing to note uh, between ice, for the isolation forest as a signal, it is usually considered anomalous if it's less than zero. Anything greater than zero is considered uh, to be a true sample. Anything less than zero is to be considered anomalous. So you'll see we get some negative numbers there. The output in the signal form is bound between 0.5 and negative 0.5. The nice part about using it as a signal is you can then use our identify tool suite or formula to clean the signal and do your value searches or other methods that you may want to use to find your anomalous sections. It can also give you a good idea of what your data looks like um, and why your results might be giving you some noise in them. Let's go ahead and take a look at the self-organizing maps now. So I'll select the journal and we'll select the work step for the self-organizing map start. And then we'll navigate back to the tools panel and I'll select the self-organizing map under the machine learning options. And I'll give it a name. We'll go ahead and add the input signals and then we'll slide under the advanced tab. You'll see the usual options to limit the training to within a condition in the training window and restrict the output. You'll see some new additional options if you open up the additional training configuration. Uh, you'll see something called a sigma. This affects um, how other nodes are affected during the grouping process when one node wins a sample. So this is the general radius of how uh, the nodes are affected. So I'm going to go ahead and set this to 0 0.5. And then you'll see the learning rate. The learning rate is what determines how far a center moves when it gets a new sample. The lower this is, the more accurate the center will be for each one of your clusters. However, the lower it is, the longer it will take to train. Another option I want to uh, bring your attention to is the optional grid dimension. Um, so we'll go ahead and set this to 8. And what the optional grid dimension is, is the number of nodes or clusters you're going to find. Uh, when you do it, uh, technically it will be the square, so this is going to be an 8 by 8 grid uh, when we define it this way. 
So I'll end up with 64 clusters in my grid or nodes in my grid. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll set that to eight. And then lastly, you'll see the number of iterations. And then um, if you wanna randomize your data before going ahead and putting it in this algorithm. One more thing is there are anomalies expected in the uh, in this algorithm. Uh, so if you happen to know that, we'll go ahead uh, and set this to 98 um, because as we saw before, it was a pretty clean data set. So we don't expect that many uh, anomalies. Um, with that, we can go ahead and click execute. And you'll see we get a bunch of noisy samples. Uh, one thing that we may want to do uh, similar to isolation forest is ignore short capsules and gaps. And I'll go ahead and set those to 20 minutes each. And then we'll click execute again. And now you can see something uh, that represents a little bit more of anomalous data. And it looks very similar to what we saw with the isolation forest. We'll go ahead and take a look at it in the XY plot just so you guys can see. And let me add the coloring. And now you can see uh, we indeed found the area kind of down off on the left of the scatter plot. And there's an additional one here at the upper end of the scatter plot. I'll flip back to trend view so you can see uh, the option as well. So you can see these higher points uh, were also flagged as anomalous using self-organizing map. One other thing to note is the self-organizing map does also offer the output type as a signal. So we'll go ahead and run this and you guys can take a look. Um, so uh, in this, you'll get a bound between zero and 100 so it's slightly different than the isolation forest, 100 being 100% anomalous uh, and 0 being 0% uh, likely to be anomalous. And so you can mess around with the thresholds that you expect your uh, anomalous behavior to be and um, come to your own anomalous decisions uh, by taking a look at the output signal. As you can imagine, there is quite a bit of overlap for use cases with both isolation forest and self-organizing map. To wrap things up, let's take a quick look at some of the pros and cons of each algorithm. Isolation forest is highly efficient when working with high dimensional data. It is fast, scalable, and does not require labeled data, meaning you don't need to define what an anomaly looks like ahead of time. However, one of its downsides is that it relies on random data splits. You might get slightly different results each time you run it, even if the same configuration is used. It also works best when anomalies are few, distinct, and well separated from the rest of the data. On the other hand, self-organizing maps are great at capturing patterns, such as different operating modes or process drift. They also handle large data sets well and can model nonlinear relationships. Like isolation forest, they don't require labeled data. That said, training self-organizing maps can take longer and tuning map parameters like grid size and learning rate can be more complex and less intuitive.